Sonia starts to watch Church of the Rock on television. And every Sunday morning, she goes into the family room, and every Sunday morning, she turns on that TV, and she's watching away. And every Sunday morning, Yvonne would walk into the room, point at the television, and say, No me gusto que el hombre. Now, I'm not sure why he talked like a Mexican bandito, but in my story, I, I, and for those of you that don't know what I just said, I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. So today I'm beginning a brand new series called Grace Revisited. And grace is one of those things that, you know, you do need to revisit it once in a while. We think we understand grace, but it's so easy to lose the essence of it, and it's so important to our faith. And speaking of revisiting, I was thinking about this this week because... I preached my very, very first message ever in my life 40 years ago this month. Yeah, do the math. I was, do the math. I was seven years old, right? <laughs> and uh, anyway, here's what the message was on. It was, the message was entitled Mercy and Grace. And I talked about the, these two things of mercy and grace. And this message was so good that I had the congregation already practicing mercy and grace before I was done preaching. The message was that bad and that long. It was, it was an hour and ten minutes long, and halfway through, they're just extending me mercy and grace because this painful, bumbly, stumbly message just continued to come at them. And finally, at the end of the message, they stood up and they gave me a standing ovation. Do, do you know why? Because it was finally over. It was terrible. It was that painful. They had to extend me the fullness of grace and mercy. And then I'll never forget because this elderly lady who always sat in the front row, she came up and she came over to me and she said, Pastor Mark, you know, I'm old enough to remember when Billy Graham started preaching. I thought, I can't believe it. She's comparing me to Billy Graham. And then she said, and you know what? He was no good either when he first started. <laughs> <laughs> so I had that nice little encouragement to, to get me going. So what we're going to be talking about is we're going to be talking about this thing called grace. And I know this might be a controversial statement. I'm going to say it anyway. Grace might be the single most important word in all of Scripture. And I love what Max Licato says. He says, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. And we're going to be looking at a verse today that is probably the, the greatest explanation of grace that you could find. It's the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to jump right into it. It's verse 4. And it says, But God who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Wow, there's a lot in that passage, isn't there? I mean, I, I'm going to say another, you know, overstatement, at least you'll think it is. I think this might be, if grace is the most important word, then this might be the most important passage in Scripture. Because if you can understand what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2, if you can understand grace, you will understand the gospel. And, you know, Paul is interesting because he actually calls the gospel the gospel of the grace of God. That is his chosen term for it, which differs from Jesus. Remember, Jesus called it the gospel of the kingdom. Paul comes along and he calls it something different. He talks about the grace of God and how important and preeminent that is. And we'll find out in a minute why he did that. And he tells us that the season, the era in which we are living, is called the dispensation of grace. 
And he's contrasting that with the dispensation of law or the administration of the law in the Old Testament. The New Testament is this time when God is dispensing and administrating grace to humanity. And he's so profoundly excited and stirred within his soul about this. But here's what's fascinating about this, that Paul did not invent this word grace. He actually borrowed it from Greek culture. It's the, the Greek word charis is, is the word where we get our English word charisma or charismatic from. And the word goes back literally hundreds and hundreds of years. It goes back, I mean, the, the New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek, which was common Greek. And then before that, there was classical Greek. And so we find the word charis used in Koine and classical Greek. It was used by the Greek philosophers like Socrates and Aristotle and Plato. It was used by the classical writers like Homer and the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it had a particular meaning that every Greek-speaking person would understand. And the word charis actually means gift. We call it grace, but it actually means gift. And everything good and everything pleasurable in life in Greek culture was considered a charis a gift, and every kindness, and every, every favor, and every forgiveness, and every thanks, and every gratitude, and every actual physical gift that you would get from another person, or from the gods in their case, was considered a charis. And so Paul comes along and he commandeers this word that they all knew. And there was a reason he did that, because he understood that they would know what it meant. And so he uses a word that their culture would understand. And see, even though they lived in the Roman culture and the Romans conquered the, the world militarily, the Greeks conquered the world culturally. In fact, in the times of, of the, the Greek empire, they, the Greeks would come in and they would never actually kill a, a single person. The people would say, yes, come, conquer us. We want your culture. We want your democracy and your freedom of speech. And we want the fact that you were such refined people compared to the Romans, which, of course, these oversexed barbarians is what they were. And the Greeks, of course, were much more sophisticated. And so Paul uses this word. And it's fascinating because it's, it's used 126 times, the word charis, 126 times in Scripture. And Paul uses it 97 times. Almost all of the times it's used, he uses it. And Jesus, how, guess, take a wild stab at it. How many times do you think Jesus used the word charis, grace? How many times? Zero. Not one. It's only used five times in the gospel. And every time it refers to grace that Jesus had, but Jesus himself didn't use that word. You say, why is that? Well, you see... Paul was an academic. He, he, he trained at the feet of Gamaliel. And he was this academic person. He would have, stood, he would have understood. They, they wrote in Greek. The Bible, was, the New Testament was written in Greek. And, and he would have studied this. And he saw that word. And he co-opted that word from Greek culture because he knew the hearers would understand that everything good from God was a gift. It was It was grace. And, I, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I don't think we fully understand grace today. I think grace to us, we have dumbed it down to something far less than Paul intended it and the Bible intended it to be. If you were to go to a theological dictionary and look up the word grace, this is what you'll discover. It'll say unmerited favor or undeserved favor. Almost exclusively you'll see that again and again. And, and that's, not in, that's not incorrect. It's just woefully inadequate for what the word means. And here's, here's how I spell grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. And every gift, every perfect gift that comes down from above, from the Father of lights, is a gift of grace that God gives us. And so salvation is by the grace of God, and forgiveness is by the grace of God, and sanctification is by the grace of God, and gifting is by the grace of God, and the power is by the grace of God, and the healing is by the grace of God, and everything that God gives us, everything good and perfect in this world, is a gift of grace to us. And if we begin to understand that, and we go, oh, that's what grace is. And we begin to realize what this passage is all about. And I'm going to make a provocative statement here. And it's this, that Christianity is the single only grace-based religion in history. I know some of you go, well, what do you mean? And see, if you look at the other religions, most of the other religions are what we would call karma-based. 
Now, when I talk about karma-based religions, you, your mind immediately goes to Buddhism and Hinduism and Jainism, where, you know, you live a certain way, and if you live badly in this life, you'll come back as a gutter rat next life, or maybe as a fly and have to eat poop for the rest of that life. And I don't know how you work your way back from a fly eating poop to, you know, being a, a, an Indian prince, but who knows how that all works. And so we always think in terms of, of karma being, you know, something to do with reincarnation. But in fact, any religion that is based on works is a karma-based religion. Th think about that for a moment, right? That's what, wh we all know that, <laughs> you've all seen this happen, right? Where so somebody does something quite awful and you go, oh, that's bad karma, man. That's going to come back and bite you. Right? We believe in karma. People believe in karma. They think if you do something bad, you're going to have to pay the price for that. And so we don't realize that most religions, in fact, I'm going to say all of them, are basically karmic religions where they believe that you are rewarded or punished based on what you do, right? There's a retributive justice that comes. And you know, in the last few years in this church, and I've been very excited about it, we have seen more people come to faith from Arab backgrounds, Persian backgrounds, Chinese and, and Southeast Asian backgrounds, people who had no framework for Christianity at all. And they almost always ask me the same question when it comes to the gospel, and they say this. They say, are you telling me that all I have to do is to accept Jesus as my Savior and everything I've ever done in my life has been forgiven? And you know what the answer to that is? Yes. The answer is yes. The answer is yes to that. And they can't believe it because... He said, you, by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man but boast. There's no way to work away your way into heaven. You can't do enough good enough deeds. You can't walk enough little old ladies across the street in order to get to heaven, right? And so I just want to take a moment, and I want to kind of drive a wedge between mercy and grace here for a moment. Because this passage talked about grace, it talked about mercy, talked about faith. And so... We'll talk about three things here. You've got, you've got justice, and you've got mercy, and you've got grace, and here's the difference between those things. See, justice is when you get what you deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you deserve. And grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Now, I don't know if you followed that, but this illustration will clear it all up. So you leave church here today, and you're going down McGillivray Boulevard, and it goes from 80 to 60, and the cop is always sitting there. You know the one I'm talking about. And uh, if you go 80 through the 60, he's going to pull you over. And justice is he will give you a ticket. Mercy is he will let you off with a warning. And grace is he will let you off with a warning and give you one of his Tim Hortons donuts. <laughs> And it happened to Peter, sitting right over there. <laughs> Last week, he told me this story. So he's, Peter over here, he's, a, he's a part of our prayer ministry on Tuesday morning, and he drove out of the parking lot, and he was heading towards Pembina Highway, and he got clocked at 74 kilometers an hour, and the cop pulled him over and said, you were doing 74, and this is what Peter said to him. He said, would there be any grace today <laughs> for a man who's turning 80 years old in a couple of weeks? <laughs> The cop went to his car, came back, and says, I'm going to let you off with a warning. And then Peter immediately said, thank you, officer, and you need to know we pray for you every single week. <laughs> <laughs> and the officer said, I'm a Christian too. You have a good day. <laughs> so then Peter told me, God gave me grace. And I said, no, he didn't give you grace. He showed you mercy that day because you didn't get the donut. <laughs> And mercy is an important concept. Don't misunderstand me here. It's, it's, it's very, very important. Uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, there was this man, he was going to be executed for treason. And uh, he was about to go to the gallows, and his mother was in the crowd. Napoleon was standing there, and she, shout, she shouted, Have mercy on my son, have mercy on my son. And Napoleon heard her and looked out in the crowd and said, Madam, does your son deserve mercy? And she said, No. If he deserved it, it wouldn't be mercy. And then Napoleon said, you are so right. 
I will show your son mercy and stay the execution. And you see, that's what mercy is. Mercy is we don't deserve it. See, unmerited favor actually is a better definition of mercy than it is of grace. And one of my favorite stories about this is, is there's this convent, this Catholic convent of nuns in California, and they have a compound, and on their fence they have this sign, and it says, absolutely no trespassing, violators will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> the sisters of justice. <laughs> they may need a little bit of work on that. And see, here, here's what I want to share with you today. That the, one of the big differences, both grace and mercy are both unmerited, undeserving favor. There's no question about that. But the big difference between the two of them is this, is that grace requires faith, whereas mercy does not. He said this, that, that by uh, grace you were saved through through faith, right? So I'm going to tell you two stories here that you are familiar with that will illustrate this because I think it's important. So the first story is the story of the, the, the madman of Gadara. And so the madman of Gadara, he is, uh, you know, busy uh, doing crazy things. He's running around the, the, you know, the mountains at night cutting himself and screaming wildly and he's full, full of demons. And Jesus is miles away in Galilee, and he decides he's going to go see this man. This guy's not praying. He's not asking for Jesus to come. But he gets in a boat, and he crosses the Sea of Galilee to the land of the Gadarenes. He seeks out this man, and he casts out these demons into a herd of pigs, and the man is made well. Now, here's the, here's the point I don't want you to miss. The man was not calling for him. He wasn't praying. He wasn't seeking deliverance. Jesus just went and did it. And so then we find the man, he's sitting in his right man mind, and he wants to follow Jesus. And he said, may I come with you? And he says, no, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your people and back to your town, and I want you to tell them how the Lord showed you mercy. And you see, that was mercy. There was no faith involved with that. There was no aspect of that that was related to the man, man of Gadara. He just received it because God, Jesus, showed mercy on him in that moment. Now, there's another story that, that's quite a contrast from this, because it's the story of blind Bartimaeus. Now, blind Bartimaeus, of course, he was a blind beggar. Jesus was in town. He couldn't see him, but he could hear him. And he starts to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Do you remember this? Now, here's what's different. The difference between these two men is they were both bound by something, but the, the, the blind Bartimaeus was seeking Jesus, not the other way around. And he was seeking him, and he's crying out. And he doesn't have any understanding of what grace is. I don't think he would have that. But he, under, he knew what mercy was, because people know what mercy is. And so he's crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. And the disciples tried to shush him and said, you know, quit it. You're bugging him. And Jesus heard him, and he goes over. It's, it says he persisted the more and shouted the more. And Jesus goes over and says, what do you want me to do for you? And the man said, that I may receive my sight. Now, who remembers what Jesus said? And Jesus said, go your way, your faith has made you well. And you see, what happened was this man exhibited faith. He knew that Jesus could heal. He thought it was mercy. But in fact, he didn't receive mercy. He received grace. By grace, you were saved through faith. By grace, you were healed through faith. And he says, by your faith, you have been made well. And so what we understand about grace is grace is God's hand extending down to man, right? And faith is man's hand reaching up to attain it. Are you following this? Here's my question for you, though. What would come first? Would it be grace that comes first or faith? Grace. Which one? Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's, it's always going to be grace. I mean, God extended his grace to you long before you were even thinking about it. And in fact, the reformers called it prevenient grace. And prevenient grace, with theological word, means the preceding grace. Grace that goes out before. Grace that while you are still a sinner, God reaches out to you with his grace. He's extending his hand to you. In fact, the scripture says that all day long, God stands with his arms stretched out to re rebellious and stubborn people. And so he's always extending his grace to the world. And so his hand of grace is always out, and it's up to us, and it's incumbent upon us to reach out and lay a hold of that 
grace. And that's what faith is. By grace you were saved. The grace saves us. But the mechanism is faith, right? So here, here's, this, here's the story. So we have Paul the Apostle, who's the guy writing about all this grace stuff. And he has this story that you know, where he was, before he was Paul the Apostle, who was he? Who remembers? Saul of Tarsus. Bad dude, persecuting the church, killing Christians. And he is not seeking God, correct? He's not seeking Jesus. He's, not, he's actually interested in destroying Jesus, not seeking him out. But he's on his way to Damascus to find some more Christians to kill and persecute. And Jesus appears to him. In a bright light, he falls off his horse, he falls to the ground, and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He takes this personal, right? Why are you persecuting me? And instantly, there is an epiphany, a transformation in Paul's life where he says, he, he didn't answer why he was persecuting him, he says, what do you want me to do? Immediately was a response of faith. The Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, was the extension of grace. He was obviously willing to forgive him, which we know the rest of the story he did. And he extended grace to him. And Paul says, what do you want me to do? And he says, here's what I want you to do. And he calls him into the ministry. And you see, we know that Paul was saved by grace through faith and not by mercy. And I can prove it to you. I'm glad you asked. Because I have a verse for you. You're going to like it. This will be worth your time. It is in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Listen to this. It says, When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son to me. Paul says, he was extending his grace to me from my mother's womb. The call of God on my life was there from my mother's womb. It took all those years for Paul to finally realize that he was calling him to a place of faith. And finally on that day, and that's why when Paul writes this verse and he says, God through his rich mercy has sent his grace by grace we are saved through faith. Not of works lest any man should boast. This is why he is so excited and passionate about this. Because he understands that God is extending his grace to the whole world. And he's reaching out his hand and he's waiting for man to reach out his hand and lay a hold of it. Let me close with one final story here. Those of you that have been in this church long enough will remember this story. But it's a classic so you're going to love it. So there's this, this couple that, that I met, and originally, uh, they're Spanish-speaking, both of them, but, but Yvonne, he was from Madrid, Spain. And he met Sonia, who was also Spanish-speaking, online, online dating thing, and she was in El Salvador, Central America. And so they began to communicate online in Spanish, and they fell in love online, and they decided they were going to come together from their two countries, and they were going to get married. And don't ask me why, of all places in the world, they chose Winnipeg. I guess Winnipeg is right smack in the middle, and it's kind of the city of love. What can I tell you? <laughs> and so, and so, so anyway, they come and they move to Winnipeg, and they get married. And while they're here, Sonia, not Yvonne, Sonia starts to watch Church of the Rock on television. And every Sunday morning she goes into the family room and every Sunday morning she turns on that TV and she's watching away. And every Sunday morning Yvonne would walk into the room, point at the television and say, no me gusto que el hombre. Now I'm not sure why he talked like a Mexican bandito, but in my story, I, I, and, and for those of you that don't know what I just said, I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. In fact, he may have used the word odio, which means I hate that guy. And I, I mean, think about that. Who wouldn't like me? I mean, that's crazy. That's, this is the weirdest part of the story. Who wouldn't like me? But anyway, every day he said, I hate that guy, every Sunday. And then she said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, because I really want to go visit that church before we leave Winnipeg. Well, he didn't want to go, but finally he agreed to come. And so they came, and I'll never forget, because they sat in about the third row back on my left side there. And here's what he told me later, that as I preached the message that particular Sunday in English, he heard every word in Spanish. Every word in Spanish. He told me this. 
And it was, he couldn't figure out if I was speaking English or Spanish. And his English was very poor, so he wouldn't have understood my, my message in English. And I talk kind of fast, I don't know if you've noticed that. And uh, anyway, he sat there and his eyes were like saucers. And every time I looked at him, his eyes were like this because he heard me speaking in Spanish. I think that's the crazy part of the story. And then I got to the end of the service, like we always do, and I give people an invitation to accept Christ. And so this is his version of the story. He said, I looked at the crowd and I said, now if there's anyone out there that would like to put their hand up to invite Jesus into their life, I would like you to do that. And then he says, and I turned to him and said, and you need to put up your hand. <laughs> and then I looked over here and I said, if there's anyone else that would like to join these folks, you need to put up your hand. And he said, I kept on turning to him and yelling at him in Spanish to put up his hand. And so he stuck his hands under, <laughs> under his seat. And he thought, I'm not putting my hand down. And anyway, he, he was sitting there resisting like this. And all of a sudden, he went, ah! And, he's, <laughs> and he stuck his hand up. And he invited Christ into his life as his Lord and Savior. And he told me this story that he had heard the whole thing in Spanish. Yeah, he did it. He heard, he heard the whole thing in Spanish, as I said. He accepted the, the Lord, and then he said, what do you want me to do next? I said, we're doing a baptism in two weeks. We need you to get baptized. Two weeks later, he was up on stage giving the testimony about how he had been preached to in Spanish, and he'd given his heart to Christ. And two weeks after that, they moved to Madrid, and we never saw them again. And God used you and Winnipeg in this church, and the power of God and the grace of God extended to him, because that's... What grace is all about. Grace is the power of God. It is the essence of our faith. And by grace, everything good in this life comes. And by grace, you are saved through faith. Let's stand together, shall we? All right, let's take a moment. And I'm going to ask you all to bow your heads. And I'm going to do what I did that day and do every day. And that's invite you to make a decision today. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I only have one thing to say to you. Put up your hand! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. I'm just joking. Uh, but if you're here today and you've never had that moment, that definitive moment where you've invited Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you that opportunity today. And we make it really simple. Jesus' hand is already extending down from heaven to you. The grace, the forgiveness, the power of God, everything he has for you. And all you have to do is to reach back up and lay your hand in his. And if you're here today, you've never invited Christ into your life, or maybe you knew him in the past and you've slipped away, I want to encourage you to come back. If you're online, I also want to encourage you to do this. And nobody is looking around, and every eye is closed. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to single you out or ask you to say anything publicly. But if you'd like to make that decision today, I want you to just slip up your hand so I can see it. And once I've seen it, you can put it down again. And we'll just take a moment to do this. Thank you at the far side, back. Thank you in the middle. So let's do this. Let's all pray together, shall we? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. And the grace that you extend to me. That you died for my sin. You rose again on the third day. And you forever live to be my Lord. It's not my, about my works. I don't have to earn it. You've extended this gift to me. And today I receive it. And I thank you that by grace I'm forgiven. I'm sanctified, I'm saved, and I'm, and I'm on my way to heaven. And I thank you, Lord, for your great gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a shout, shall we? If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca 
Thank you for watching, and God bless you.